Hey everyone, welcome to Microbiology of Infectious Diseases at PLNU. I'm Dr. Cummings. In this video, I want to talk about protozoa, uh, and in particular the pathogenic protozoa. There's, these are, this is a complicated group, uh, phylogenetically, taxonomically. Protozoa are kind of all over the map. So I'm going to do my best to simplify it. Uh, we're going to use the organizational system uh, of uh, motility. Uh, and it doesn't make a lot of sense taxonomically, but it's a pretty handy way to think about them um, from a clinical perspective. So we're going to look at the four motility modes, if you will. Those that have flagella, those that have cilia, those that move by crawling like amoeba, and then a group called the AP complexins that theoretically are non-modal, and yes, yet there are exceptions uh, to that rule as well within the AP complexins. So don't let it throw you off or frustrate you that uh, the, the organization of our understanding of protozoa is kind of craziness and it's not as well structured as well um, as predictable as, as you'd like it to be. It isn't for any of us. It's just the way it goes and that's just what we have to deal with. I just want to remind you that protozoa are in fact eukaryotes. And so they are on this third domain of the tree of life. We've got the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And the eukarya includes the animals and the fungi and the plants that we're all so familiar with. Um, but then shooting off in multiple directions as we go down this main branch of the eukarya are various protozoa. Some protozoa are closely related and others are super distantly related. It's just... Again, just the way it goes. So we're going to have to think about how we define protozoa. Well, number one, they're eukaryotes, okay? And so remind yourself of the architecture of a eukaryotic cell and of the uh, general genome principles that we learned about a eukaryotic cell. And then think of, and then remind yourself that they fit into the three different main types of eukaryotic pathogens that we're interested in. We already talked about the fungi. These are the protozoa. And in the last video of this series, we'll talk about the worms, the helmets. So what exactly are protozoa? They're, they're slippery, but there are a few things they all have in common. Protozoa are always going to be single-celled. They're always going to be eukaryotic. No prokaryotic protozoa. They're single-celled. They're not multicellular. They're eukaryotic. They lack a cell wall. Let's put a little asterisk next to that. Some of them have what's called a pellicle, which is a wall-like structure, uh, either outside of or underneath the cell membrane. But by definition, we say they have no cell wall. There's certainly no cell wall like a peptidoglycan wall you see in bacteria or a, um, or a, a large polysaccharide wall like you see in, um, in the plants but they do lack a traditional cell wall, but there's a handful of them that seem to have a, a cell wall-like structure called a pellicle. And they're all modal with one group that has some exceptions within it. There's always exceptions to the rules and the protozoa are kind of the worst about that. So they're all modal with the exception of one particular group. So we're, for example, um, malaria, right? We're all familiar with malaria. We've heard of it at least. The malaria parasite, the organism that causes malaria, is in the genus Plasmodium. You can see it down here, Plasmodium. It likes to get into the bloodstream, it likes to get into the red blood cells directly. And it's this little modal parasite that swims all around and causes trouble. And it's spread by mosquitoes in that particular instance. So let's look at the, the four groupings based on their motility patterns, okay? So let's first look at the flagellates. The flagellates have one or more flagella, and eukaryotic flagella are structured quite differently from prokaryotic flagella. The flagellates have several important genera. Genera is plural for genus. Giardia, maybe you've heard of giardia or the disease that causes giardiasis, sometimes called like a backpacker's diarrhea. Leishmania causes leishmaniasis. Uh, trichomonas causes trichomoniasis, which is a vaginal inflammation. Trypanosoma causes trypanosomiasis, but there's several species of trypanosomas, and so we can differentiate them. So, for example, trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma cruzi causes something called Chagas disease, particularly common in, uh, in Central and South America and Latin American countries. There's an insect vector called the triatamine bug, sometimes called the kissing bug that uh, it, that the, the trypanosome has to 
inhabit as part of its complex life cycle. It can't skip the triatamine bug. What happens is people are sleeping, the triatamine bug bites them, usually around the face somewhere. That's why it's called the kissing bug. And the bite itself doesn't do it. What it does is it bites them and then it poops. And the little bug poops close to the bite. And when you're just sort of sleeping and something itches a little bit, and you just sort of rub it like this, you self or auto inoculate. You inadvertently rub the bug's feces into the bite and the trypanosomes get into the bloodstream that way and cause this Chagas disease. And you can read more in your book about uh, a lot of the signs and symptoms associated with Chagas disease. So the flagellates, these four are arguably the most important of the flagellate protozoa parasites. Uh, the amoebas, there are several, but far and away the most important of the amoebas is Entamoeba histolytica. Let me get this out of the way. Entamoeba histolytica causes what we call an amoebic dysentery. There are some amoebas that can cross over the blood-brain barrier and uh, cause brain disease and even kill people. With all of these, whether it's an amoeba or one of the others, they have generally two, <laughs> they have complex life cycle, but they generally have two very recognizable life stages that they all seem to have. There's what's called a cyst stage, and the cyst is really tough environmentally. It's sort of a dormant stage. It's easy for it to, to spread. And often when people are shedding a, a protozoan, it's coming out as a cyst. The cyst gets back into a human body and wakes up. It ex exists itself. Um, and by doing so, it becomes what's called a trophozoite. The trophozoite is the feeding, active, infecting stage. So you can see down here in this image, a cyst and a trophozoite, all right? Um, and they're all that that's common to all of them, but some life cycles are more complicated than others. In most cases, we see that the mature cyst gets ingested in one form or another, and it wakes up, becomes a trophozoite, causes trouble, and then becomes encysted again before being passed through something like the feces and the feces, Entamoeba histolytica. Uh, follows that particular pattern. The amoebas move by, by amoeboid movement, which is crawling. If you're not sure what that looks like, uh, go onto YouTube and look at amoeboid movement, and you'll see that it's based on cytoplasmic extensions. There are no actual structures like cilia or flagella for the movement. They literally just extend pseudopodia or false feet and crawl along surfaces. Really cool looking, actually. So go check out a video of amoeboid movement, and you'll have a better sense of the amoebas. Third category are the ciliates. There are lots and lots and lots of ciliates. You probably studied uh, paramecium when you were a kid in school. That's a ciliate. It's a non-infectious ciliate. As far as we know, there's only one ciliate we recognize that causes infection in humans, and that's Ballantidium coli or B. coli. Uh, it gets passed from the feces of one person through, unfortunately, the mouth of the next by way of either water or food. Um, healthy pigs are often involved, so it can be pig feces uh, that gets into water or food that gets orally ingested. Realistically, healthy people uh, typically are going to be asymptomatic. The, the people that are most likely to get sick from Ballantidium coli are going to be malnourished people, immunocompromised people, people whose bodies are weakened already. And far and away, the most cases of B. coli infection are in the Philippines. So if you're living in the United States and you never travel to the Philippines, you may never see this. Uh, if your uh, healthcare practice takes you to the Philippines, this may be something that needs to be on your radar, Ballantidium coli. So those are the first three that are clearly motile, the flagellates, the amoebas, and the ciliates. Okay? They can all get around through those different uh, movement mechanisms. Now the AP complexins are generally thought of as non-motile, but there's some big exceptions to it. So for example, plasmodium that causes, we talked about this at the beginning of this video, plasmodium that causes malaria actually has at least one, if not more, life stages where it's highly motile. In fact, that's one of the ways we recognize it. So pain in the butt, I know. This is how the, the, the protozoa work. Uh, lots of breaking of the rules. The AP complexins in general are non-motile. Plasmodium is a, a, a great exception to that rule, a very important exception to that rule because uh, we know that it has some motile life stages, and yet it's not really well understood what's driving that motility during those stages. It's not flagella, it's not amoeboid movement, and it's not cilia. 
Um, it's, it's a mystery is what it is. And there are scientists working on trying to understand the motility of plasmodium because that motility is critical for it to get from one life cycle stage to the next. A couple other important AP complexins you may have heard of, toxoplasma, cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium is often found in the same place as you'd find giardia, like in a, a mountain stream, uh, some unpurified water, something along those lines. So we've got four major categories, three that are clearly motile, one that is supposedly non-motile, but there are clearly some exceptions to that rule as well. All right, what are some take-home points as we think about the big picture of these protozoa parasites? So protozoa are single-celled, motile, highly motile except for the AP complexins, cell wall lists, except for those that have a pellicle, eukaryotic parasites. Now, why am I using the word parasites? In an ecological sense, a parasite is uh, anything that takes advantage of a host for its own benefit. So there's harm to the host, there's benefit to the parasite. So in that strictest sense, every pathogen is a parasite. Clinically speaking, the only time we use the term parasites, though, are going to be for protozoa pathogens and the helminths, which is our next video, the worms, okay? So if you go to your doctor, because you have a virus, and you say, hey, I learned in biology that viruses are parasites, so I'm gonna tell the doctor I've got a parasite. They're thinking completely differently than you, okay? So biologically, all pathogens are parasites. Clinically speaking, though, um, only the protozoa are referred to as parasites, or the worms, the helminths, are referred to as parasites. So key take home single-celled, motile, wall-less, eukaryotic parasites. The main categories uh, for considering them and thinking about them are those that have flagella, those that have cilia, those that crawl by amoeboid movement, and then the supposedly non-motile AP complexins. And then finally, some common protozoa pathogens are gonna include Giardia, that's one you'll hear a lot about, Entamoeba, that shows up often, Balantidium is common in the Philippines and really no place else, and then Plasmodium, which has been common across the entire planet at various stages, even in the United States, here in the US, the Mississippi River Valley, uh, uh, malaria was a huge, huge problem uh, before we had mosquito control. So some common protozoal pathogens for you to consider.